June 25th, 1996. And I'm sitting here with my grandparents, Murray and Sylvia Barish. Grandma Sylvia just uh, last week turned 80 years old. She was born in 1916. And uh, Murray, who was born in 1912 in July, is about to turn 84. Actually, I've done a lot of things in my life, but the hardest thing that I've ever had to do was to try to convince my grandfather to sit down with me for a few minutes here today to talk about his life. It was like pulling teeth. But uh, finally, uh, my salesmanship prevailed, and uh, here we are. Yeah, hey, like I told uh, Grandma, that uh, if you would try to sell me Brooklyn Bridge, you may succeed. You, uh, you didn't want to do this movie, did you? How come? Because to me, I, I think it's a matter of uh, egoism, not egotism, but egoism. And uh, I, I, to me, it's presumptuous. And that's why I, I, I didn't think that much of it. Everybody knows that you don't want to do this. Everybody <laughs> knows that. But we want to do it for you. So everybody out there should know that Grandpa does not want to be sitting here doing this, but he's doing it for me. And that's that. I wanted to start with uh, Grandpa in his early years back in uh, Poland. Uh, you were born in 1912 in, what was it, Balkabisk? Yeah. That's right. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in uh, Balkavisk, Poland? Well, I don't remember too much, uh, but what could I tell you? Uh, we came here, I, I, I came here with my family uh, September 22nd, 1921. And so I was about nine years old at the time. But you remember that your father was a prosperous businessman there, right? Uh, my father was quite uh, prosperous because uh, he had built a building, uh, of course a small building of, uh, uh, I guess, two, three floors. And that was the only one in the town. Uh, and of course he was at the time in the uh, lumber business. And he had, uh, as I remember very vividly, uh, uh, the lumber yard was situated with a body of water. And he would ship down, float down the lumber to his customers, as they do in this country, you know, but of course in a small way. And uh, he did that and did very well with it. But unfortunately, uh, it was either the Polacks, the Polish, or the Polacks, we called them in those days, or the Germans, I think it was the Polacks, that came in one day and took everything away. They took all the lumber away, and they gave him an IOU, which was worthless. That was to pacify them. And of course, my mother at the time had a breakdown as a result of that, because all of a sudden, overnight, they became poor. So was this, uh, this was clearly an anti-Semitic move to do? Oh yes, of course. They were constantly doing that because there were times when they'd have a pogrom and we'd hide in the cellar of the building because they'd come in and... Uh, and, and you remember every, that? I didn't know. Oh yes, I don't know. What would happen at these pogroms? Well, they would clean, they'd take away everything they wanted. They would beat you too, no? Uh, they would, would they would beat us if uh, we were around, but we were we locked ourselves in the cellar of the building, of the building that we owned. You saw like pictures. The Nazis did to the Jews later on. In Germany. That's right. And it was just because you were Jewish. Oh, obviously. That's the only reason the Nazis started up. So, uh, Saul, your older brother, along with your uncle Max came to America several years before you did. And then when you came, you came with the entire rest of your family, right? Two of my older brothers were in, in this country already, in the United States. When did they come? Who, Saul and uh, uh, Yes, and they came just about five years before. And I had an uncle here, uh, Max Rutschick, who became quite successful. And uh, knowing the plight that we were facing, 
uh, he and my brothers had us brought to this country. And uh, from there on, of course, uh, we settled that time on uh, Second Avenue and, uh, and 8th Street or St. Mark's Place, uh, and I think on the fourth floor of the building, which is still there and looks better today than, than it did then. Tell us a little bit about what your uh, parents were like. How, how well do you remember them? Well, uh, unfortunately, my pa parents didn't live very long after that. Uh, we came in, uh, in 1921, and uh, in 1925, uh, 1925 uh, got sick, and uh, she died, April 1 of uh, 1925, she died, and two years later, uh, April 2, 1927, my father died. How old were they when they died? Well, my mother was, uh, I think, about 53, and my father was about 60. Hey, how old were you when they died? Uh, how old was I? Well, I, was, I wasn't even 13 years old. His mother was planning his bar mitzvah when she died. He, she died three months before his bar mitzvah. When you first moved to New York and you were living here on 2nd Avenue on 8th Street, yeah. uh, how long did you live there? Oh, we lived here a short while. Uh, let me see. You moved here in 21 and you moved there in 23. I remember that. Yeah, we moved to 1923 Daily Air. That's how I remember. The year 1923. In 1923, they moved to 1923 Daily Air. So at this point, when you first moved to New York in 1921 and eventually moved to the Bronx in 1923, you're, you're, who was there? All of your brothers and sisters? Yeah, we, we all lived together. No, my sister didn't. The older sister was married. She, she was married. She came She lived on Avenue A, I think. Uh, that was Fagel? So that was Fagel? Fagel, yeah, that, that was, was my oldest sister. sister. I was the youngest. The youngest of uh, seven? That's right. You were the baby. So what was the, the difference in ages between you and Fagel? Uh, uh, I and my sister? Yeah, your oldest sister. Oh, 18 years. Years. 18 years. 18 years. 18 years. Any other remembrances of your parents as people, what they were like? Well, of course, my parents were very religious. Orthodox. Uh, and they conducted themselves that way. Everything was kosher, everything had to be just so. so it was then, after they died that uh, I, I changed my, my ways uh, as far as religion was concerned. Where normally I would uh, pray, go to shul, as I did for my parents when they died, to say Kaddish for them. I would have kept it up, but uh, as I said, I changed my ways and I uh, acted accordingly. What made you change your ways? Well, because if my parents were around, then naturally I would have uh, kept up uh, as I did originally. I would have been orthodox because in deference to my parents. But uh, after they died, it was a different. Uh, it, was, it wasn't easy to conduct yourself in that in that orthodox fashion. Tell us a little bit about uh, Aunt Ida. When you when you moved first, you moved to New York and then you moved up to the Bronx because Aunt Ida was there. That's right. Uh, tell us about Aunt Ida. Well, she was uh, she was very good to me. When I think of her, I can't, I can't talk. She was a wonderful lady, a very sweet lady. She called him Ayasin, which in... That's an orphan. Yeah, she an orphan. And she was very good to him, because he was already 15. But, and she was a good soul to everybody. She loved everyone. She never would say a bad word about anyone. When you came into her house, she started to pinch your face and pinch your face. She didn't know what to do for you first. Now, 
Now she was the sister of who? His mother. She was your mother's Michal's sister. Michal's sister. Michal's sister. sister. She was the youngest sister, I'd say, right? Yeah. So when you went up to the Bronx, because Aunt Ida was there, did you actually live in Aunt Ida? Yeah, that's, that's why we looked and moved to No, the they Bronx. moved to the Bronx. The whole for his, his parents were alive when they moved to the Bronx. Oh. Okay, so when your parents died, you, 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 you had a different... You see, we moved there in 1923. Uh, to remember the, the, the address because it was the year 1923 on Daly Avenue, uh, not far from where my Aunt Ida lived with her family. And uh, of course they were very close, you know, uh, the sisters. And, uh, and as I said, my mother died, so my Aunt Ida took a, a very great interest in me. But he never lived with them because she had a big family. She had six yeah. rooms. And you had a big family living in your apartment at the time, too. Yes. yes. But she was your favorite because you were the youngest. Well, because she took such an interest in me. She watched over me and she was afraid that I'd go astray, that she I'd, uh, you know, I uh, was young and uh, she thought uh, God knows what's going to happen to me. Tell us a little bit about Uncle Max. You mentioned that Uncle Max was, was in going Yeah, well, he came over. to this country. Uh, he was financed by my parents because, as I said, my parents were quite successful in the old country. But he came a long time before your brothers even in 1960. Oh, yes, he came, he, he came first to America. How long before your brothers, you know? Oh, I don't remember. You wouldn't remember that. But he became very successful. And... Uh, and of course, he, uh, he would spare money to, um, to bring us to America as quickly as possible. In the meantime, my brothers were here already, and uh, they, came, they became uh, successful in a relatively small way, but they pooled money together and had us brought to America. Now, how did uh, Uncle Max do so well? What business was he in? Well, he was in the, originally he was in the fabric business. He started in the fabric business, woolens and all, all kinds. He went from one thing to another. In fact, he had a whole building that he used for himself as a result because he was involved in a lot of different kinds of fabrics. He began buying up a lot of Army and Navy merchandise, you know. After World War I. And, uh, and you know, he became very successful. And he even went into real estate. Uh, Howard Beach was one of his, uh, it turned swamp. They built uh, homes there, and it was, became swampy, and the homes floated away, and it was a failure. So he developed Howard Beach, but it became a failure. I, as far as I know, he did. And how did Howard Beach, Howard Beach get its name? Well, I don't know. He yeah, had a son started. named Howard, and That's I fine. presume that he named him after his son. Yeah, I think so. So let's talk, let's talk now about your uh, early years in the Bronx when you're now 15 years old and, and those late teenage years. What do you remember? What were you like? Well, before that, before we moved there, I used to sell newspapers. Um, on Saturday night particularly, the English papers were, at that time, I don't remember, 10 cents uh, a news and a quarter, I think, the Times. I don't remember exactly what the prices were, but and the and, Jewish forward too, you and the Jewish forward, and I lived right across the street at the time. See, I lived on Second Avenue, and uh, uh, I was I sold papers there. And before the fact you were fifteen, you sold papers there. Sure. Oh yeah. Sure. There were very many restaurants like Rackner's and Rappel's. In those days, it was uh, really uh, like Broadway today. And all the Jewish theaters were And I would go busy. into the restaurants with the papers, and uh, the fellas would sit there with girls, and I'd give them, sell them a paper, you know, it's a paper, mister, and all right, uh, uh, the paper was maybe 10 cents, he'd give me a quarter and say, all right, keep it, uh, Sonny or Kid or whatever. And so I used to pick up 12 $14 or $15 
on a Saturday night. Of course, I'd work to probably two, three in the morning, but that was no problem. Of course, I lived right across the street. That must have been like a uh, fortune back then, 16 bucks a night. Well, of course, it was a lot of money. And uh, then when we moved up to the Bronx, uh, I tried to sell uh, caps, uh, you know, men's caps. I'd walk over to the taxi drivers who in those days would buy a cap, but that didn't work out very well. I'd walk all the way to City Island as a result, and uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a very profitable business. When you came over here, you were only nine, and I presume you didn't speak any English. How did you learn how to speak English? Well, <laughs> they put her into school right away. I went to school. Of course, I didn't have much of a schooling, but um, I educated myself, really. Well, one of the things about my father that's so impressive is how bright he is and how much he's learned all on his own, how self-educated he is. I mean, he used to drive us crazy because he was always showing, speaking in these words that nobody ever knew what he was talking about. He was always looking up every word. He was always uh, correcting our definitions, our pronunciations. But he really knew so much and he knows so much. Because I told all the kids that I used to hang out with, if you hear me pronounce word wrong, tell me. In other words, don't laugh at me, but tell me, and I will correct myself. And I did that, and uh, I, I attained the, uh, the knowledge that I have by working at it, really. His vocabulary amazes me. I once used the word prerogative, and he looked, he looked me straight in the eye and said, that's wrong. It's not prerogative, it's prerogative. Now, I thought that the word was prerogative, and so I said, no, this was before I realized that he knew everything. <laughs> I said, no, nope, it's prerogative. He marched up, got the dictionary, and sure enough, it was prerogative. Yeah, I went to, uh, as far as the second grade, uh, Mars High School. Two years of high school. Two years of high school. That's amazing. And then I dropped out uh, for obvious reasons, because I needed to work. Uh, my parents weren't uh, here anymore, and, uh, and naturally I wanted to earn money. He didn't want to have to rely on his brothers for everything. I guess if I, uh, I wa if I wanted to continue, I'm sure that my brothers would have uh, subsidized me. But uh, that isn't what I did, and so whether it was right or wrong, that's it. What else did you, what else did you uh, like to do in your teenage years? For fun, what did you do for fun? Well, it wasn't much fun. I mean, I didn't, uh, like most kids would play ball and, uh, and do this or that, but I, uh, I wasn't that interested in it. Tell us about the Hotel Arlington. Well, the Hotel Arlington, as I got older, uh, I used to play cards. Uh, my brother Al did played with us, in fact, with uh, two detectives, uh, Lolly Benjamin, I remember, and the other one was Wittenberg, who lived already in the, he lived in the Bronx at the time. He would drive me home after we had this escapade of playing cards. And uh, of course, I played to win, and I did. And. Uh, as a matter of fact, they used to comment, uh, uh, before the night is over, uh, the money will be in Murray's pocket. And it did work out that way most times. There was one time that I won $421, I remember. And then I became frightened over it because the uh, bellhop used to bring up food to us. There was a child's right on the next block and they'd bring up food to us. And I stopped to think that, who knows, maybe one day, through the bellhop or whoever, will be held up. And here, these two policemen had guns. And I thought to myself, my God, I'll wind up in the newspapers or get killed or there'll be shootings and whatever. 
So that, to me, was a warning. And I stopped playing that. Well, Aunt Ida was also And, and I, here I had my Aunt Ida in mind all this time because she was afraid that I'd get in trouble because she, I don't remember whether she knew about it or not, that I played cards. And uh, so I stopped playing. That was the end of my gambling. I think without uh, Tanta Ida's uh, advice and influence over you, you could have become a Jewish gangster? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I always had her in mind because she watched over me and she was afraid of what may happen to me. And uh, whatever I did, her was, she was always in the back of my mind. What about pool? Did you ever play pool? Pool I did play, but that was a harmless game. I used to play on Tremont Avenue. And uh, I became a fairly good pool player. Uh, it's really billiards, but I played pool. Billiards was a more intricate game. So I, I had a curfew as a teenager, and I stayed out a couple of hours past that curfew. And when I came home, there he was in the living room waiting to talk to me. And he asked me where I was. And rather than lie, I said, if you want to know the truth, I was shooting pool with my friends. And the first thing out of his mouth was, well, you shouldn't have done that, or you were late. He asked me, was I any good at shooting pool? And I said I wasn't bad, I wasn't great, but I was bad. He invited me to shoot pool with him the following week or whenever I was free, and we went to a pool room together. And I should have known something was up because as soon as we walked into a pool room, a few of his old, old friends said, Murray, how are you? It's been a long time. <laughs> then we proceeded, proceeded to shoot pool and he beat the heck out of me. He ran a number of balls in a row, and the following day, I found out from a friend of his, his friend Marty Treppel, who they grew up together, that my father hustler when he was growing up in the in New York City. So, Grandpa, how did you two meet? How did you get together? Uh, I used to go to a candy store, which, like, I lived on Southern about a while, and uh, that's in the Bronx, and uh, I'd go into this candy store to have a drink of soda. My mother's sister was nearby, and we had visited her, just my mother and I. And we were walking home from her house, and we stopped in to say hello in this candy store. They were cousins or they something? They were cousins of my father's. And he was there. So he so, uh, said goodbye to my cousin and to come visit us soon. And he said, what about me? We didn't even know he was there. Right? That's right. And so I walked him home. And that's how it started. So you liked her right from the, right from the first sight. First time you saw Sylvia, you liked her. Well, you know, she was a beautiful girl. You can see some of the pictures, they'll tell you. And so naturally, uh, I saw a good-looking girl. So I walked home with them. I asked if it's all right if I walk along. And so I walked with them. I walked along with him when we were talking, and, uh, and that's how it all started. She couldn't resist me. <laughs> oh. I was all 15, you should know. Yeah, 15 and a half. I was 15 and a half. And how old were you, Grant? He was four years old, I was 19 and a half. Four years old. Robbing the cradle. Well, well. What can you do? So you started dating started dating soon after that. Yeah, we kept company for over two years. Two and a half. Two and a half years. Until she turned 18. That's when I married her, on her 18th birthday. Grandpa, I want to talk a little bit now about your, uh, your business and professional life. Um, I'm under the impression that you've started out working for your brothers, and eventually you went out on your own. Uh, tell us that story. He was not in business with his brothers. There was the oldest brother owned the business, and they all worked for him. We all worked for him. Four of them worked for him. You see, we had bought. We, when I say we, it was my brother. Had, we bought a small woolen mill one, that went bankrupt, bankrupt, in West Warwick, Rhode Island, and. Uh, and th we started with that little mill, making our own goods. So therefore, we weren't jobbers. We did very well. 
very successful. He was a very good man, but uh, I had to tell him so that he wanted everything for himself. And so I, uh, I told him this a year before. I told Mom a year before, if things don't change for me, I'm going to leave him. And uh, he was the youngest of all, and he was the first to leave. And she told her mother, and naturally the mother was frightened. You know, after all, here I had a job. Uh, it was a good job. And uh, to leave, uh, God knows I wouldn't uh, succeed. What year was this now? This was January 1939 I left him. Wasn't that in the middle of the Depression? Oh, yes. Oh, oh yeah. The Depression was 1932. Very few people would have the nerve to leave a successful business where he was doing very well and go out on their own with a wife and two babies to take care of. It's really incredible when you think of it. What I was doing, I was starting in the jobbing business because I didn't have a mill. And I told this to my brother at the time. A year before, I told him that if things don't change, I'm going to leave you. And so when the, when the year came, went by, I said to my brother, I'm leaving you. He said to me, what are you going to do? You don't know anything of you. You don't have a woolen mill. You're going to go in the jobbing business. What do you know about the jobbing business and all that business? I said, Sal, I'll learn. I'm not going to stay with you. So Sal said to me, if you leave me, I'm breaking up the whole thing. I says, Sal, I would suggest that you keep the brothers and leave and, and keep my and divide my salary between them. I was drawing $55 a week then, which was a lot of money in those days. He says, no, I'm, I'm not. And I left. But you were the best salesman of all the brothers, right? Oh, yes. Well, that's why Sal said, if you leave, I'm breaking it all up. When he left his brother's company, right. he was the largest, he was the entire sales force. I mean, he was the sales force. Murray. Murray was the most successful salesman. He so he promised me uh, he'd give me money that nobody should know. I said, Sal, you're not going to give me what you're not going to give my brothers. I says, how can I take more money that nobody should know about? I'm not going to take more money from you. Saul wanted to give him more money to stay. But Murray said, you can't treat me any differently than you treat all of the other brothers. And he wouldn't hear of that. There's only one way. Either everybody gets it or, or nobody gets it. They would have been a tremendous firm if they all stayed together. And I told them years after, it was your doing. And I says, the trouble with you was that you liked everything, everything for yourself. So you think that if you all the, all the brothers stayed together and you figured out a way to, to figure it out monetarily, that it really could have been a huge company? Oh, it would have been a tremendous company. Well, we would have been a, a very big firm because we, had, we made money when nobody made money. In those days, people weren't making money because things were so bad. It was a depression, you see. Even when I went out, things were bad. But I was prepared to work, and I had all the confidence in the world. I knew I was going to do it. I just knew it. I told them that time. And I did. He was a very astute businessman at a very young age. He took risks. And I, I think it was just great that what he accomplished. I used to make money all the time. I made money all the time. Right from the beginning, I did very well. Right from the beginning. Uh, of course, I'd come home and she'd say, well, how was it today and how was it today? And then she stopped asking me because I did very well. There was a time when I worked in Manhattan. I used to meet him in the street. And I would be walking on Fifth Avenue going uptown. And I would see this blur across <laughs> the street. And he would be coming downtown. And I know a block before I'd have to cross the street. Otherwise, he'd be whizzing by me. And he would stop and chat. We would walk. I would walk backwards, and he would walk forwards. And he would just keep going. He had his business to attend to. He had his tough schedule. Man on the move. I started to go around 
Tamils, only Tamils. And I introduced myself wherever I went. And of course, I didn't have any kind of money to speak of. So I would go into the credit man. I'd always say to them, who is the, where is the goods are generally factored by bankers, private bankers. And I'd go and introduce myself and tell them my story. That here I am, I'm married, I left a job, a good paying job. I have two children, uh, but I want to be on my own. And uh, spoke of Jimmy Smith, of uh, J.P. Stevens at the time, when I came in and asked him for credit, he refused to give it to me and gave me an argument. How dare you start in business when everybody's going broke? Jobs are going broke and you're starting in business and you have two children? And of course, at that time, I couldn't answer him the way I would have liked to. I said to him, obviously, I think it's because I can make a living. I have two children, and I left the job. I wasn't fired. And so he said, well, the only way I'll sell you is if you pay cash before delivery. I says, all right, I'll do that. And I had a little checkbook with me at the time because I expected that. And if I wrote him out a check for $300, I remember. And he made sure that it was more than what he was going to ship me. And I remember he sent me a check for about $10, $12. And uh, that's how it started. But then I went to other, like Jake, uh, Meinhard Greff, which became commercial factors. They're the biggest in the business today. And uh, I told them my story, uh, the same stories I told this uh, Jimmy Smith. And he said to me, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 60 days. How's that? I said, 60 days? That's wonderful. That was the terms. One ten and that's 60. And I said, Mr. Alward, you can be sure that I'll pay this long before it's due because I want more goods and I wouldn't expect you to ship more goods on top of money that I owe you. Next, I went to William Islam, Alban. He became the top man. Uh, Alward, unfortunately, died not long after. And he was a young man. But uh, Alban, A-L-B-I-N, I told him the same story. And he said, well, if Jimmy Alward gave you credit, 60 days, you can have it here too. And that's how it started. Eventually, uh, Mr. Smith gave me credit too. He knew where to sell material. He knew what his customers wanted. And if his customers didn't want it, he sold it to them. He told them why they wanted it. When my father went into business, he had a royal typewriter on which he typed whatever letters he needed, an old-fashioned royal typewriter. I guess in those days it wasn't old-fashioned. But in all the years he was in business, he used the same typewriter. And I now have it here in my house because it does remind me of my father. Well, you know what uh, resulted in my starting in business. At the time, I... Uh, became very friendly with the uh, head man at the bank. He liked what I was doing. What I was doing was I would buy goods on 110 or net 60 days. I would discount all bills. As soon as I'd get a bill, even before I had the goods, receive the merchandise. I wasn't worried about getting the, mer the right merchandise. I would uh, pay the bill, take off. 1% for 10 days and take off as anticipation for as many days before 10 days. You follow? And the bank liked what I was doing very much because they knew, they gave me all the credit I wanted. I would call up and say, uh, Mr. McGrath, uh, I need some money. He'd say, how much do you owe me? Owe us. Well, I'd say $10,000, whatever. And you want 5000 more. OK, I'll credit your account. That meant that I had more money. And this went on and on 
and I would do this constantly, and I made a lot of money just that way. Uh, and I don't think anybody ever thought of that. In, in, at the same time, I enhanced my credit standing with Dunham Bradstreet. Nobody at 10 to 20,000 had a high credit rating, which is very important. With a, low with a low amount of money, it's hard to get a, a high credit rating because it generally comes with bigger amounts when you show a statement of 100000 or $200,000. But I got it when, it was, when I showed a statement of $10,000. And then, of course, uh, it finally ended in the million-dollar rating. Now, you're, uh, you're paying bills on time and being very credit worthy went far beyond just your, your behavior in business. You, it also fell into your, your home life as well, right? I mean, you always paid bills on time, even for your home bills. Too, right? Oh, well, today it's small stuff. The same day, same day. The I, day? I send out a check right away. I don't like to owe money because I don't pay, there's no anticipation when I, uh, uh, for rent. When I get the bill, the rent bill, I send a check. The same day, on the telephone. Or the Whatever it is, but that's nothing, that's small stuff. So the first of the month, that rent check goes out. That's right. All the time. But wasn't there one time when you were not going to be home, the, the uh, first of the month fell on a weekend, and you were going to be away for that day? What did you do then? Well, uh, I had that. Uh, when we lived in the, in, on Pelham Parkway, there was a, 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 man, a renting agent by the name of Mr. Friedman. He happened to be a cousin of my, uh, she had to have been the cousin of my accountant that died about uh, 15 years ago. And uh, when we'd go away for a weekend, I used to bring him in a check for the rent. And he'd say, he'd say, Mr. Barish, he says, you, you're paying the rent before? He says, you always pay on the first. But I said, I'm going to be away, and I like to have rent to be paid. And he said, but I'm happy. <laughs> you know what I have to go through to get rent. In those days, they used to pay uh, the rent. I think we were paying $48, I think. Yeah. What? $48. Uh, nice three room and we had, at that time, it was a beautiful apartment for $48. But most people would pay the rent, break it up, pay, give them ten dollars or twenty dollars, and you have to go again and again and again. That was still the depression in the 1930s. Yeah, you know they didn't uh, they didn't pay because they didn't have it, but I had it. See, so I said, but Mr. Friedman, I, we're going away, and I like the rent to be paid, and so of course he couldn't get over it. So tell tell us a little bit about the family life when uh, when your children were born, first Marilyn and Joni, and then Carl. Tell us how that changed things. How, how was family life with, uh, with everybody? I guess you could tell them better than I can. Yeah, we were married uh, in 34, and our first baby was born the end of 35. She happened to be a little girl. It turned out to be a beautiful woman. <laughs> and <laughs> two years after that, we had another little girl in 38. But actually, it was only two years and two weeks apart. But one was born in December and the other January 5th. But they were only two years and two weeks apart. And uh, we would, would have liked to have a little boy, but we decided when they both go to well, school. Well, she was the one that wanted, because she knew I wanted a boy to carry on my business. And we decided, I decided. She that decided. When they both start school, when the second daughter was going to kindergarten, we would try and have a little boy. And we did. And she was five years and nine months old when we had the little boy. And that was our family. And I really did, wasn't figuring on it. But she knew that I wanted a boy to be able to carry on my business. Because little by little, you know, I was becoming established. And so he came. And it of was course, more to carry on the name. Now you have a barrage to carry on your name. That's what I wanted. So what was it like now? Uh, you had, what was family life like? How were, how did the kids behave, Joni and Marilyn and, and Carl? Oh, how they were always a source, they were always a source of pleasure, those two girls. Well, Joni and Marilyn 
were always, from the day they were tiny, they, I never had any grief with them. I believe he's forgetful. In his memory, it's true. He was very, very watchful over them, that they never got into any trouble with the opposite sex. We didn't always date or stop dating who he wanted us to stop dating. I can remember my very first date. I was picked up and we were walking to, to the twins' house, which was about four or five blocks away. I don't know if Sheila was going, but the twins were going. And it's a funny story. By the time we walked to the second or third block, I had the sense that something else was going on. I turned around and he was following us. He was like in the background where you couldn't see him, but I saw him. And every time I dated someone for more than three or four times, you'd say, you went with him three or four times, that's enough for him. It's enough. Of, he had enough. My sincere hope was, I used to say that to Grandma, that when they marry, they should marry the kind of fellows that will get along. That they got. Otherwise, they would tear them apart, which is true, you know. They always get along very But very well. fortunately, I don't have to tell you how they get along. We, we got it in all ways. It was wonderful. Yeah, we were lucky with the son-in-laws, just as we were with the daughters. They but I was very much afraid, because generally that happens. They got along very well. The but, boys. The, but you know how well they got along, so. And they still do to this day. And Alvin called on Sunday, and uh, you know how many times he kissed me at the party? Yeah, he kept kissing all the boys. <laughs> so Johnny Because he all feels that I, I owe it all to him. He, owe, he owes it all to me, rather. He always had good advice. And he was like, very shortly after we were married, he became like a father. I, I was always very fond of him. Always. On my 60th birthday, he told me, I always liked you. <laughs> he said to him, When he gave Al? me my gift, he Al? said, Al, I want you to know something. I always liked you. <laughs> and I looked at him and said, you know what? I always liked you, too. <laughs> so, Dad, um... You've known Maurice for a long time. He's not your father, but almost like a father to you. Would you say that uh, he's had any kind of influence in, in your life? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody drove my car. I never kept them. Everybody, whoever was in the family, drove my car. All the children and there. Well, all the children, Alvin. I never had a car. I never got a car. I never used my father's car. From the moment that we were, just before we were engaged, he always let me use his car, gave me the keys, and he had a real nice car. Right. And he, he gave was, me the keys. He Go was ahead. Generous he and was loving. Very generous. And, uh, and his father, his father drove the car, went to, uh, to his parents. He, he oh, asked me if he could have my car. He had a small car at the time. He had a little car at that time, and he left me with that car, and I got a summons because one of the lights didn't work. A few times, I think, it happened that as soon as his headlight went out, Tail he light. got a ticket. Tail light, headlight. People would get be speeding by, but he would get a ticket for his tail light out. Now, uh, some funny things have happened to you that, that don't often happen to, to other people. My father was like the innocent bystander who got into trouble. I mean, the, 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 in a way. You had a, a jaywalking ticket and you had a problem with birds. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, when I, yeah, well, I once called up and I told the kids that I got a, jay, a jaywalking ticket. Yeah. And I deserved it because the cop across the street was yelling to me. It was on Houston Street. It's a wide street, a wide crossing, Houston Street and Broadway. And this cop was yelling to me not to go, go. I didn't hear him, you know. And so I came across. He says to me, I have to give you a, a summons. I said, you don't have to. He says, but you did. You deserve it. Now, what about birds finding your hat? A, uh... Oh, that was a long time ago. I, uh, in those days, on a, I used to wear a hat. You always wore a hat. Well, in those days, you wore a hat. And I wore a hat, and I was with my brother, Al. And uh, a birdie flew by, and the droppings right on my hat. 
So I. It I, happened more than once, my dear. <laughs> it happened twice. That's right. So. There was something about him that the birdies always struck. We were once sitting in Stuyvesant Park here, and he didn't have a hat on, but it landed on his forehead. He would teach us. He was always teaching us, and he was teaching us through stories, a lot of them of his own experiences. And did you once have your hat stolen from the subway? Yes. Remember the train started up and the black man took it off his head? Oh, yeah, yeah. Somebody stole my hat. He put his hand through the window and took my hat. He always told us, never after this incident, he told us never to sit on the side of the subway where the door opens on the platform. Because he was on the subway sitting on the train and somebody put their hand and it took his hat. <laughs> if you ever see a big crowd, he would tell us, don't go near it. Walk the other direction. Don't ever walk into a big crowd. You never know what's going to be there. If you see a crowd forming, go away from it. Because... I stuck my head in, and this guy hit, punched me. <laughs> he punched me in the face, Wait. and he ran away. He once saw a fight going on in the street, and he stood there, and somebody punched him. And that taught me something. What, what was the I, When I see a crowd, I walk. Always look the other way. My it's mother taught me that. See, I learned. I learned. I, I used to be a good learner. So now, what's, what would you say is the most important part of your life now? Getting up every morning, looking in the obituary page. And if you're not there... I look for my name, and if my name is not there, I, I still I feel I'm alive. So what, do you, what, what was on your mind when you were doing all these, these things, when you were working so hard? What was it all for? What was it all for? Well, it was all for the, the betterment of my life, my family. And the family, of course. Well, naturally, I was out to make money, and I made it. So family is very important to you? Well, of course, they were very important to me, and uh, that's why I strove to make money. He was always around. He, I never can remember coming to that house to see you during the week, on the weekend, when he was not in the house. He was always there. He was into, he, he knew every one of our friends. He was very involved he was in the, our lives. He was the he official was. greeter. He knew every single thing that was going on in your life all the time. He was very, very protective. We were going to go to sleepaway camp the first year. Marilyn and I were going. We were very young. I think I was five and a half and Marilyn was seven and a half. Well, before he let us go to the camp, he went and spent a weekend there and slept out or slept in bunks and it roughed it, but that was typical. He wasn't going to send us to a camp unless he knew the whole uh, configuration of it, how it worked, where the dining room was, how far of a walk we would have. He had to make sure it was going to be right for us. He wouldn't allow me to ride a bicycle in the street, but he taught me to ride a bicycle, and he ran up and down, up and down, holding on to the seat of the bicycle. He was a very giving man, my father, to, to the girls and to myself. He never denied anything. He came to every school function, which very few parents did in those days. Fathers didn't take off from work to go to uh, a school play. And to this day, family is about the most important thing in your life. Not about. It is the most important thing. My, my children, my wife, uh, of course. We've grown to respect each other a great deal. At one time, there was a bit of a problem there, but I've always loved him, and I had a hard time showing it to him. And in regards, I think it was the same way there, because of his expectation for me and my failure to reach it. But there's a great deal of respect now and a great deal of love. And we speak to each other on the phone now that I'm living in Los Angeles. It's very easy to tell how he feels about me, and I'm sure he feels that he, feel, he feels me the reverberations on the phone. What about your grandchildren? Well, when I say my children, of course my grandchildren as well. If they're not Needless to say, do I have to say about my grandchildren? Of course, they're all very they're important to me. Well, my father was never, ever late. I don't believe he was ever late to anything. You see, I tell you, I never liked anybody to be late with me. When you make an appointment with me, you have to be there. That characteristic rubbed off on me I, even at the earliest ages. I remember waking up to go to kindergarten 
like at six o'clock in the morning, afraid that I would be late to school. I used to wake up the whole family. <laughs> and I think it probably stemmed from his never being late. And I don't think I've ever been late. Andy had a bad habit of being late with me. And that was very annoying to me. There's really no excuses. But it just always seems something happens. There's something going on. And I, I got to telling him. He sat me down and told me about this. Stephen Manning, always on time. My father, always early. And where was he going? To the hotel to have dinner with me. Right? Yeah. I was approximately 15 years old, so Mr. Barish and Mrs. Barish. And I would have to wait. We'd all have to wait. I said, Andy, you must be on time with me. Otherwise, don't make an appointment with me. I understand that it's important to be on time, that yeah, you're making an appointment with me, and I'm keeping you waiting. And I apologize for all the times I've done this. I was always happy to see him. Always been a joy seeing Mr. Bar Mrs. 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 Barish. Because here we'd all wait. In the hotel, whoever was there, we'd have to wait for him. It was never the intention to, to make Grandpa feel slighted at all. I love Grandpa, and I always want to be on time. Oh, he always pay cash. At one time, he asked me, Denton, do you know my name? I said, no, I'm not. I'm sorry, I don't, because he never pay by credit card. So he said, OK, my name is Mr. Barish. From that onwards, I always greeted Mr. Barish, because I didn't know his name. At least for five, six years, I really didn't know his name. I didn't like it, and I let him know about it, and I think everybody else got to know about it. Everybody oh, knows. everybody knows. Yeah, because, well, that's what an appointment's for. You can't make an appointment and make a jackass out of him. I don't want to make a jackass out of Grandpa. First, you have two screwdrivers. After two screwdrivers, you have two fruit cups, appetizer, then two breakfast steak, medium rare, french fry, very crisp. Miss Barish, breakfast steak, medium rare, with string beans, no butter. <laughs> <laughs> because my time is as valuable as your time. I Certainly. Agree. Well, Rob, Robbie has an appointment with us. He's prompt on the dock. Well, we're all scared. <laughs> he takes, yeah, he takes very good care of me. Very good yeah. care. Yes. He takes good care of me, that's for sure. Well, because after all, if I'm taking, you are my guests, and I'm good enough to invite you, which was always my pleasure, Always. Now I understand how important it is to be on time, and I'm going to live by this. Everybody went to the hotel with, with me. I never spared the money. So you, got it. you have to be good enough to be on time. Thank you, Grandpa. I owe it all to you. Looking back now over your life, what advice do you think you would offer your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to help them get through their lives better? The, 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 your nose clean. You have to, by all means, be honest with yourself and with everybody that you're doing business with or working for. Do the best job you can. And by all means, Build a reputation. Reputation means a great deal. To me, it always meant a great deal. Always. Because I got along on my reputation. Is there anything that you would have done differently? No, I wouldn't have done it differently because I was very proud of what I did. That's why I say I, I'm presumptuous about myself. Uh, but you're not an egoist. Uh, well, I am in a way because I value my reputation. It's my ego, it's my reputation, not egotism, which you, means you talk about it. See, I don't, I don't like to talk about myself. I'm doing it now because it's a, a asked of me. I never wanted to talk about myself, brag about myself. You should always do the right thing. Be honest with yourself and honest with everybody else. Because that, that is the best lie. No lies. I never lied to those people that I did. The, I'm not an angel. Don't think that I'm an angel. I, I, I don't float with, with wings. But if you're going to tell a lie that's going to be found out, they'll never believe the truth. 
because people don't believe the truth what you're known as a liar. So that's the advice I can give you.